Okay. Another, um, another one other example of that is, um, and this was de developed by Canadian anarchists who came up with this notion of a diversity of tactics in terms of how we organize. Um, but what that has done is also, I think, a form of how we decenter how states decide things or how we govern is where things are determined with one centralized focus and then we all decide that we need to do something together. Whereas the brilliance, I think, of a diversity of tactics is getting in the idea that we, again, are all differentiated people with different opinions about things and different viewpoints and different things we're passionate about struggling toward, and how can we actually come up with a way that allows us to decide to bring in the dissonance and the diversity of who we are and move forward with that based on some kind of framework of also knowing that we've got some kind of common goal. And in this case, because anarchism's common goal is the expansion of freedom <laughs> against domination, is how can we bring all the ways we do that together to move forward? Um, and and the, but the whole of who we are creates that space. So I, my first kind of argument there is that we have actually not only been, there is a global zeitgeist of a non-status way of understanding power and how we govern ourselves, but that anarchists have actually been crucial, especially in North America, to actually decentering that. Um, Andre had pointed to sort of people's writings of late in terms of also theories of how the state has been decentered in terms of how we even think about that. And theoretically, there's been a host of new works coming out of on a point to like James Scott's books, The Art of Not Being Governed, um, where people are actually able to do work where they're actually also able to decenter the state. Uh, the Rao Zabechi book that I pointed to, too, where he talks about dispersing power, he looks at actually existing movements in Bolivia about 10 years ago, where he looks at both formal and informal structures of non-status self-governance and how they function together in both moments of insurrection and moments of communities self-governing. Um, it's a really moving book. He looks at how justice works under that, how people make decisions, how they defend themselves. Um, okay. Um, I I wanted to point to at this moment of why I think this is anarchist moment is not necessarily because of anarchists, but that there's actually a shift in what's happening in terms of how states are functioning or how government is functioning. And that to some degree, that is creating both a space and a place where anarchists are actually having the, the work they're doing is actually pointing at how we might push past that space. So there is, um, as hopefully anarchist political philosophers, one of our tasks right now will be to, to rethink the notion of the state. I really appreciated Judith Butler's talk yesterday where she was trying to point to different ways the Palestinian people are envisioning what it might look like to govern themselves or what states might look like, and we may disagree with those. But for us to do more work around what we understand is happening with the state. Um, but some of the shifts that I think anarchists have been particularly um, pushing at in terms of the work they've done and that are actually happening with the state is um, a shift from the state as being something that we understand as both public, for the public welfare, and a welfare state um, that provides things people need, the safe social safety net, but also keeps things in common for people. Um, is that okay? And that we have increasingly a state, a shift in statecraft and governance, top-down governance is moving toward private, creating privatization of governance, and at the same time creating mechanisms of policing and control, um, and that the state's role is shifting. Um, now, whether it ever really did what it, I just said it did, it, did it ever provide for the public welfare anarchists would problematize? Did it, was it ever really public? But there's actually still something distinct happening when the state is shifting in terms of what's happening and how we relate to that. Um, and there's also at the same time, I think, um, a political crisis. I hate to actually use that word. I think there's a transformation in terms of how politics is happening. So we also see all sorts of sort of new forms to some degree, which maybe they're not necessarily new or they're hybrid. Um, and one is which I want to point to Venezuela, where states are trying to do more, states themselves are trying to see how they can balance sort of a diversity of tactics and how you govern people, where you keep a certain sense of power over, but you minimize its role. You maybe reduce the amount that the wealthy can have in terms of control, reduce the amount um, of people in power at the top, and you create lots of space at the bottom for, semi, for very actually participatory directly democratic self-governing spaces, and you have also still a state. <laughs> and that those things are, the state is actually trying to mediate between those two things and bring those things all to create more of a balance that will allow the state to exist in a way that it, that in other states haven't been able to. Learning from the examples of highly centralized or authoritarian states, 
and or representative democratic states, like the United States is reported to be, where neither really allows for participation in a way that actually stabilizes the state's power. And so I think Venezuela is an interesting experiment in how can someone make, maintain control, status control, but do it in a different way than we've understood states to function before. Um, um, here in the United States, we've had um, um, a lot of shifting in contestation lately over, I want to point to a sort of a political crisis within the United States where you actually have fights between the, those in power because the, the United States itself is having to switch how governance functions. So there is both a contestation with, as um, is happening lately, between um, things like the Tea Party, um, the Democrats and Republicans, um, how capitalism is functioning as shifts happen. Um, and so there's, in a sense, a destabilization of how governance is happening here. Um, and that is creating all sorts of new interesting forms here that we have to be aware of. So, for instance, in Michigan, where the governor recently, or a while back, passed a law that you can actually, under emergency conditions, um, disband all representative structures in communities and institute a emergency manager, which, to some degree, is someone who has dictatorial powers over the municipality in a state in the United States is a really interesting new form of moving toward what does that look like at the same time that things are becoming privatized. So how do we relate to shifts in the state as radicals? Um, and to some degree, I again want to point to sort of anarchist contributions and trying to understand and relate to those moments right now. Um, for the past 10 years, for instance, anarchists have shifted a lot of the work they have done to actually looking at policing, prisons, and borders. And some of the best anarchist work right now, I think, is being done around not only creating spaces of self-governance and direct democracy and participation and organizing in those spaces, but have also been taking on things like borders. So some of the best anarchist work, I think, lately has been done around things like no more deaths on the southern border of the United States, to know it's illegal in um, Canada and on um, Canadian border, by Canadian anarchists, to um, no borders camps in, in Europe and other places. Um, where there's, they're tying in both a critique of capitalism and statecraft, but also really getting at the shift in what states are doing. If states are becoming increasingly the force of policing, of policing borders, of policing who is able to pass through those borders or what is able to pass through those borders, that it's not accidental. It's anarchists thinking through what are the points at which we want to contest the way the state is appearing, the way governance is happening. It's not accidental that anarchists are making those choices around things. And the range that ways of democratizing it. So having no borders camps where people get to make decisions about how they want to do that. Or in contrast to the Minutemen who decided to be a way of outside the state policing borders, anarchists do no more deaths where they try to figure out outside of the state, how do we make borders safe for people to come across, open for people to come across humane. Um, are they fully fledged examples? No, but it's an interesting moment of where anarchists are beginning to push out spaces of non-statist um, forms of governance and intervention. Um, Judith Butler talked about the anarchists against the wall. It's all part of that. Um, and the other thing I want to point to in terms of other thing anarchists have been really influential in, in this realm of pushing at um, the outside of the policing is another area of those uh, many people in this room who are involved in is the Occupy Everything movement, which happened a couple years ago in relation to education, um, commodifying and more increasingly privatizing education. And that anarchists getting at the impulse of where governance is increasingly trying to privatize what the state has done before. And the impulse between the Occupy Everything at its best, I think, was to say it's being stolen from us increasingly and we're stealing it back. We're taking it back and making it public and common and gifting spaces to ourselves. We're reappropriating. But we're doing that in ways, again, that are much more directly democratic. We're not waiting for someone above us to do that. We're doing it in ways that actually can test that. Okay. So I hope to some degree these, both in practice and theoretically, begin to point toward how we might decenter how we understand the state. Um, okay. In the last few minutes, the last reason I think this is an anarchist moment is that it's not radicals right now, in a sense, that are doing it. I feel like all of a sudden a bunch of us woke up recently to spaces of possibility. Um, Liberation Square in Cairo and the Capitol building in Madison, or two, I wanted to point to, um, where almost it's almost a funny thing, I think, among us anarchists, we actually believe that this is possible continually, and yet it was actually startling that it actually happened, <laughs> and happened so quickly. And to me, it really challenged me as an anarchist to be, I believe these things, but when they happen, I almost don't believe them too. <laughs> um, but what I want to point to to those is both the impulse of which people carved out spaces of non-status self-organization really phenomenally quickly, 
in the ways Andre pointed out, very non-ideologically, in ways that emphasize things like I pointed to earlier, diversity of tactics come into play into doing this. So in Cairo, what I wanted to point to that I thought was lovely was in 18 days, people be, a, basically created a city within a city. A city that wasn't working for them, forms of governance that weren't working for them, they quickly created ways to decide things, from neighborhood assemblies to self-dispense committees, um, but also things like I was really fixated on the perennial question that gets asked of anarchists is, yeah, sure, how would this work in any way? Like, who's going to ever want to take out the garbage? And what I loved about what happened in Cairo is they actually figured out really quickly ways not only to take the garbage out, but we can have critiques of recycling, but there's no recycling system in Cairo, and people figured out a directly democratic, non-status way to do recycling because they felt like that was something they wanted to happen in that space. Um, ways to provide health care that people don't get under under, so ways in which it was qualitatively already better and different than what they were living in. They created the different world. They became, it, it challenged not just sort of decision making structures, but also structures of, of gender too, which I don't want to point to as much right now because I really want to get at this moment where people were suddenly doing it ourselves together to create their own community. Everything community needs. The infrastructure that we understand happens in government was happening in that space. In Madison, I think it was an interesting, what I also want to point to that sort of pushes past um, is that people created a community that was actually a substantive community within a community. Um, Madison's a relatively small town, and a lot of people have relationships with each other. There's a very large tradition of co-ops and collectives and progressive structures in Madison. But when people folded through the doors of the state house, they created a different kind of community again, where suddenly people looked at each other and figured out together how they wanted to create relationships that don't happen in the space outside it, that were qualitatively different again. Um, someone who I know was there said, once we walked through the doors of the Capitol, we became different people, even though we were the same people that we saw outside the doors. And what that profound difference of when people go into a space and make a community themselves, and how who you become in the space of making that community transforms you outside of the state. That we become fully participatory in a way that citizenship takes away from us. <laughs> we become makers and, and decision makers over the own spaces. Um, okay. I, I loved one of the chants again. I want to point to us. one of the anarchist contributions has been to be. I'm really sick of the slogan, but the whose streets are streets. Or, um, and in Madison, when people were chanting, you know, whose house our house, um, there, it's clearly problematic in many, many ways that people were trying to go into that space and try to get the, the um, representative democracy to work more for people. But what I thought was lovely about that moment that kind of connects up with how anarchists have been trying to understand a non-status form of decision making was people who hadn't thought through a non-status stance understood that it's their space to suddenly decide the world they want to make. And there's an impulse in focusing on the capital. So I want to end by saying there's something to me that's really interesting in this moment that's anarchistic where people are understanding that it's actually not simply an economic crisis, an ecological crisis, or a social crisis, but it's also a political crisis. Um, and I would actually say, rather than crisis, I, I kind of like the word transformation better, that there's some really profound shifts right happening. And to some degree, what happened in Cairo, but especially in Madison, because here we are in the United States trying to do this work of, I hopefully, um, decentering and um, getting rid of the state as part of what we do to transform the world, that in Madison, it was a really interesting impulse to take over the Capitol building, which I think nobody really even thought they were going to do at the moment. But that the space of politics as statecraft is being discredited. And to some degree, making those things our house begins to give us a new place for what democracy can look like that's a democracy that's direct. A lot of anarchists do not like the term democracy. Um, I understand that as rule 